Thank you so much. Rabbi Gordon Willig, for the Lord Ashra. I don't know that I'm good suited for this. Uh, I'm not a mechanic. Uh, I'm not well versed in educational techniques. And uh, uh, this, a subject of this importance really should be addressed by somebody with expertise in the field. I'll do the best I can, even I'm a little bit compromised tonight. I uh, uh, took a flu shot this week, and, and I'm reacting very badly to it, so I'm, I'm, I'm not up to par. What we're talking about is uh, choosing a proper school, proper yeshiva, proper high school for our children. There is nothing more valuable to us in the entire world. Not our jobs, not our houses, not our cars, than our children. And this is something that has to be approached with the greatest COVID rush, with the greatest sense of awesomeness and responsibility. I do want to say as a uh, preparatory thing though, that as awesome a responsibility as it is to try and choose the proper uh, educational facility, that we ought to be aware that we cannot delegate the uh, teaching and training of our children to any institution. The role of the school is extremely important, but primarily the teaching and training begins at home. And if the home is faulty, very difficult for the school to uh, accommodate and uh, uh, compensate for that. And basically what we need in the home is a true shalom bias. Not a put on shalom bias, but a shalom bias in which there is general true harmony and care uh, uh, between a uh, husband and wife, and true harmony and care for the children. I've said this many times and I'll repeat it again, that once you bring a child into the world, you have forfeited the right to insist on your own rights, on your own wants and needs. Our children didn't ask to be, come into this crazy world, and we bring them into it, we have the awesome obligation to give them the best opportunity for success and happiness in their lives. And I said, bring them into this crazy world. The world has never been as crazy as it is now. I mean, I grew up in the United States. I grew up in Milwaukee in the 1930s. It was nothing compared to what it is now. The street was a decent place for children to grow up. Uh, never were there billboards like there are now. Uh, in the printed media, television didn't exist then, and computers didn't exist. Uh, but speech, I mean, it's just common speech was uh, uh, decent. I remember, oh, I don't remember when it was during President Truman's, Truman's uh, administration, he once gave a speech and he used the word hell. And the country was outraged. The president used the word hell. Now we have scandalous behavior at the highest levels of the government. Almost without exception. Every day new scandals come up. And these are the leaders. And our children know it. And whether we like it or not, it impresses them. Uh, a number of years ago, a young rabbi opened up a website in which adolescents could communicate with each other anonymously. And within a very short time, there was an outrage and Rabbonim insisted to, that it must be shut down. 
because the horrible things the kids were telling each other that they were doing. I say, what do you want to do? Put your head in the sand? And if you're not going to have that website, the kids are going to stop doing it? The purpose of that website is for the parents to see what their children are involved with. And today's children, and these are all children from, from homes who are going to Torah schools and the kinds of things, the kinds of activities that they're involved in. Almost unbelievable. And we like to think, immunity, not going to happen to my kid. Well, I remember in the 1930s and early 1940s, before the salt vaccine came out, if there were two cases of polio in the city, all the swimming pools were shut down, children were not allowed to go to theaters, stay away from crowds, nobody said my child is immune. The chances of children picking up bad habits from uh, friends and peers is much greater than the chance of their picking up polio. And we've got to realize what kind of uh, difficult uh, pressure uh, children are. Alcohol, drugs, sex. The other day I was told by a father who, uh, whose son was in yeshiva and uh, was in a dormitory with another young boy. And the other young boy was using marijuana. And he was afraid that this other kid is going to squeal on him. So he turned him on to marijuana. So now this other kid is, is, is using pot. Uh, I don't believe that there is any school which is totally free of marijuana and maybe other drugs. Don't fool yourself. I asked one youngster, how far do you have to go in the yeshiva to get marijuana? He says, how far can you stretch out your hand? It's there, kids are curious, kids like it, and kids get hooked. So the question is, how are you going to judge which yeshiva to send your kids to? Well, I think you have to do some research work. First of all, I think it's important that youngsters go to a yeshiva or to a girls' day school, same thing, in which they have someone to who look, that they can look up to as an inspiration and as a role model. Years ago, that was much different. Uh, I remember when my older brothers uh, were in Masifta, that if somebody had asked them, where did they learn? They would say, by Rav Shleiman. Referring to Rosh Yeshiva, Rav Shleiman and so on. Those who were in Lakewood, where did they learn? By Rabban. And, and Yeshiva Savitz Gachon by the Rov. Ask somebody today where they learn. In Ponovich, in Mir, in Shabin, they'll give you a place, not a person. Something has happened. Now, you might say, well, look, you can't compare the situation today to 60 years ago when there were relatively few youngsters. Uh, very few books and very few young guys today can hover. The number of Talmidim is so much greater, it's impossible to have a personal relationship with Yeshua. Maybe yes, maybe no. A while back there was a study about which of the top high schools, I don't remember the entire study, but it turned out that the top high school, the, the rating of the top high school, was because the principal knew the name of every child. Now, you don't have to have a photographic memory for that. You know, 
in medical school, on the first day of histology, we had 104 kids in the class. The instructor got up and he said, um, we're, we're not in the practice of uh, taking attendance. So I'm not going to be taking attendance every day. Uh, but uh, just to go through how many uh, people, how many students there are in the class. And he began with the first student's name started with A and went through the alphabet without looking at a piece of paper, and totally by heart, and listing 104 students. This was on the first day of school. You better believe that nobody cut that class. Maybe that's unusual to have a photographic memory like that. But at least the principal, the teacher, should know the names of all the kids in the class and should have a relationship with them, a kind of relationship where you want to look up to the, you look up to the person and you want to be like him. It's wonderful to have our parents as role models. But over and above our parents as role models, we also we should see our teachers. I was fortunate that I was able to look up to my rabbi of Kaiser and I wanted to be like him. It was a fantasy. But you strive and you want to be like him. And then you want to be like him in Midos. And I think that if uh, the research that we should do is we first of all find out things about the school. Is the school flexible or rigid? Can it adjust to each student's needs? Kids are different. And you try to force them all into uh, into a, a, a mold, it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to find out, does the Rebbe, is the Rebbe capable of evaluating each student, each Talmud? And I say, how are you going to know that? Well, you know something? I know that uh, when uh, I needed a handyman and we got the name of a person, my wife called him up and she asked for three references. And she called the people who he worked for. And I think if you're going to send your child to a school, go to the parents of children who went there and ask them what was their experience. My goodness, we're going to do it with a handyman to check about his qualifications. We should at least have that uh, a kind of consideration for who's going to be teaching our children. I want to know what's the school policy if they find a kid using marijuana? They kick him out? You know what happens if they do that? All the rest of the kids who are using marijuana are now much more careful not to get caught. There are policies that schools have to establish as to what to do with such kids. Do they accommodate the slower learner? You know, one of my rabbis said to me, as he was giving me a compliment, he said, you know, I prepared this year for you and your chavrusa. I said, my goodness, there were 20 other bachim in the class. He's talking to two of us? What happened to the other 20? And I am told that in many high schools, in many yeshivas, that the uh, Magid Shir, or the Rosh Yeshiva, uh, addresses a third of the class. Now, if that happens, and if your child happens not to be one of the fourth and the third who can follow along with the Rebbe is saying, he becomes frustrated, loses interest. 
He loses interest, and if he loses interest in learning, yeah. years ago, if a person didn't have any interest in learning, he had to stay in the yeshiva. There was no place else to go. Today, there is a community outside of the street that is ready and willing to welcome anybody who wants to join. And kids who get frustrated because they can't make it in the yeshiva or in the seminary. And the reason I'm pointing out the seminary and the girls' high school is because the problem is not gender-related. Uh, there are just so many problems that occur uh, with uh, girls as with boys. So you want to know. You want to check out with parents of other kids. What kind of experience did they have? Did their son feel a relationship with the Rebbe? Now sometimes people have the idea that if the Rebbe is going to come down to the level of the kids and be their friend, you know, play ball with them and so forth, that this will tie them to the, 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 the this will be a, a bond. The idea sounds good, but it backfires. Because that's not what the kid needs. He's got all kinds of friends to play ball with. What he needs is a Rebbe to look up to. Now there's a famous story, and I'm not saying that this is the criteria that we should use, but the great Chidush Sheyarim was initially a Talmud by the cousin of Samagad. And the cousin of Samagad loved him dearly. And he once embraced him and kissed him. And the Chidush Sheyarim left him and he said, I don't need a Rebbe that kisses me, I need a Rebbe that makes my bones shatter. And he left and he went to Pshista to the Rebbe Rabbunim. We don't need teachers who are going to become friends of the kids. We do, they should take an interest in the children and uh, know what's bothering the kids. I'm not saying that they have to become therapists, but that they should have a field for the children. And that their children should feel a warmth in the yeshiva. And incidentally, if you go on the website, the name of the website, I think, is thelockers.net. And there is a column there about schools. And just go through and see what the kids are talking about. As to what they think about their schools, boys' schools, girls' schools. I'm not saying we have to accommodate to what the kids want. Another thing that's happened today, you know, the sniper that said, in my days, he said, to have a fresh apple was a treat. Candy was unheard of. And the new suit for Pesach meant that your older brother's suit was tailored to fit you. It was a hand-me-down. He says, today kids have so much of everything that if they think they're lacking something, they become frustrated and become depressed. And this may be true. You know, that kids have so much today that if they feel anything that they're lacking, uh, they feel that they're, they're, they're losing out. They're not treated justly. So I, I think that those essentially are the uh, major points. Does the Yeshiva uh, High School have a warmth? Do they feel a relationship with the Rebbeim? Do the Rebbeim adapt to, children, to young kids? You can eat this. You say, well, how can they do it? They have 30 kids in the class. I think we have to do it. I know that there are families where there are 14 children and the parents can give each child that what she needs or she needs and there are families that have only two children and the family and the kids don't get it. Not a question of quantity. And I think that they have to know what goes on with the kids. Do they, have, do they all have Blackberries? Are they texting? 
The Rav talked about texting in shul. Today we have a problem with texting on Shabbos. That's Chil of Shabbos. And kids are from homes. How'd that happen? <coughs> I'll tell you my own opinion as to why that happens. I think because many from his homes are Shomer and Shabbos. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, back in 1930, if you were a Shomer Shabbos, it was good. Because there had to be Nesiris Nefesh to be a Shomer Shabbos. You couldn't get a job to, without working on Shabbos. So a person was a Shomer Shabbos, that was a big madrege. It's not true today. Baruch Hashem, we can get jobs without Shabbos. But there's another aspect of Shabbos. Zohar v'shomer v'dibar echod nemu. There's Shomer as Yom Shabbos, which refers to Isu Malocha, and there is Zohar, and that is the Kedush of Shabbos. And the Kedush of Shabbos is clearly spelled out in Shofar Och. That you don't speak on Shabbos the way you do during the week. I'm not talking Western Hall anymore. Your speech should be more refined on Shabbos. Your walking should be more refined on Shabbos. You don't think about uh, uh, business things on Shabbos. Before I went to medical school, one of the things that the stipend told me to be cautious about is on Shabbos never to look at anything except Sifri Kurdish. So if you got the weekend times and reading on Shabbos, you're ruining the spirit of Shabbos. I was fortunate yet that I knew several people who on Shabbos didn't speak except during davening or learning. And if you went over and asked them something on Shabbos, no. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anybody around that that, that that we see that anymore. But it's a concept of Kedusha of Shabbos. You know, it's interesting. Why Zohar V'sham Abadi Barach of Nemo? Such a nasty Gemara says, Zohar V'sham, you can't say two words in one thing. You can't hear two words at one time. Because Yishmael Chut did a nest. For what? What was the purpose of it? Oh, what is that if you want to say Shomer once this is Zohar half a second later? I think the answer is that if you take a dollar bill and cut it in half, each half is not worth 50 cents. Not worth anything. And Zohar and Shomer were set together that if you separate them, they're not worth much. So when people tell me that they're Shomer Shabbos, I'm not impressed. I want them to be Zohar Shabbos. I want them to, I want the children to see a Kedusha of Shabbos. Now maybe this wasn't necessary 50 years ago. But today with the degree of Tuma that's out there, and the degree of the Tuma that's out there is rampant. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't get several calls from people who discovered that their children, their husbands, their wives, their parents are looking on pornography. And it's ruinous. Now years ago, if one wanted, a person wanted to see schmutz, they'd have to go into one of these uh, smut shops that didn't want to be seen there because it'd be humiliating. But today, the privacy of your home, the privacy of your office, or on your Blackberry, you can see all the schmutz in the world. And our kids are looking at it. You say, not my kids. Don't fool yourself. Young men and young women are full of raging hormones and full of curiosity. Oh yes, you can be very strict. You can be so strict as not to let them study English. To avoid secular studies. Well, I can tell you something, that there's a website to help people who got hooked on pornography. It's called Guard Your Eyes. Got some excellent help for people who got into this terrible addiction. I want to tell you that this money has been raised to make this website in Yiddish. 
for the young people who don't know how to read English because they were never taught, and you know where, the, where those are coming from. The far right. I don't want to get into the kind of discussion of secular studies now. That's a volatile issue. But I just want to tell you just one thing that I'm impressed with. Okay. All of Yiddishkeit is based on Yiddish Shemayim and Ahavos Hashem. Right? That's it. That's, that's where it begins. That's where it ends. So the Rambam says, how do you get Ahavos Hashem and Yiddish Hashem? How do you do that? So these look at the Rambam. The Rambam says if a person will consider and meditate and study the wonders of creation and see the enormous wisdom of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world and appreciate the wonders of nature, that will bring him to Yiras Hashem and Ahavas Hashem. When do we teach this to our children? Do you know the enormous, enormous chachma that you see in human physiology? Just unbelievable. When do we teach things to, to, to our children of chachma sabri? You get up in the morning and say, Asha yotzeres ha'odam bechachma. Where's the wisdom? Marabu ma'ashach ha'ashem kulam bechachma. See, so where's the chachma? I think we have to. And I don't necessarily this belongs to these years. This can be done at home. I think that a few years ago there was a book put out by Art School called Our Wondrous World. It's an excellent, excellent book of showing all the wonders of creation. Once you read and understand the Chachm of, of creation, it's like impossible to say that this was that there was not a Bria, that there was not a creation. So I think that our children have to know that. And I think this is something that could be that could be done at home. It doesn't have to be designated to the yeshivas. And I think this is something that parents can do. There's enough material available to be able to do so. But to get back to evaluating yeshivas and evaluating girls' schools, I do think that we have to find out from parents of children who've gone through particular schools. I mean, just don't say, okay, it looks like a good school, right? I say you wouldn't take a handyman for that. Get an evaluation. How many of the kids have in your school have blackberries? How many of the kids have computers at home? How many of the kids go hanging around at the at the malls? What do the kids do for entertainment? All of the kinds of things, because I say there's a crazy world out there. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, a kind of world that never anticipated that it could happen. And you say, but studying Torah will protect them from it. Don't fool yourself. I've seen wonderful but Torah who've gotten hooked. And I'll tell you where I think that comes from. Now this is my own theory. I saw in one sefer that says that before Mashiach will come, Hashem will give the sultan extraordinary powers. He's done it. As a Gemol in Kedushin, fascinating Gemol, that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Meir were taunting people who were sinful. So the sultan says, you think that you're so great, I'll fix you. So the Sultan disguised himself as an attractive woman and tried to seduce these two great tzaddikim. And both of them went after the woman. Until the Kodesh Bochel intervened and stopped them. I said, wait a minute, what are you telling me? You're telling me that Rabbi and Rabbi Kiva could not come under Yitzhak? That's absurd. Of course they could. This wasn't the Yitzhak. They weren't dealing with the Yetzirah, they were dealing with the Malach. They were dealing with the Sultan. This was not a natural Yetzirah, this was a supernatural power. 
And when the Sotan himself is involved, even Toichi itself is not an adequate protection. I told you that the Sefer said that Hashem is going to give the Sotan extraordinary powers. Hashem gave the Sotan the right to live inside of a computer. And I think that the internet, oh, well, the internet is a wonderful thing, right? but the Sotan has gotten in there, and with all of the violence and all of the schmutz that it has, right? He's ruining our children and ruining our families, ruining our marriages, and destroying the basis of family life. So, if your kids have uh, access to internet, whether it's at a computer, or whether it's a Blackberry, or whatever else these technological devices are, be careful. Keep an open communication with your children. We're not back in the old ages, we're not back in the 1930s and 1940s. There's certain subjects that you don't want to raise with your children because it's inconvenient. You can't afford that, that's a luxury you can't have anymore. Because kids are picking it up from everywhere. The billboards will tell them. There's a wonderful booklet put out by uh, Sarah Diamond. Um, how to uh, talk to your children, how Orthodox parents should talk to their children about the facts of life and how to relate it to them. Because if they're not going to get it in a kosher way from parents, they're going to get it from the kids, they're going to get it from the street. So you want to find out from the yeshivas and girls schools, you want to find out what went on there. What's been the attitude of the kids to each other? What's the attitude toward the administration? What kind of uh, parent uh, dialogue is there between the parents and the administration? There are all kinds of things that are absolutely necessary. And if you find that the principal of a yeshiva or of a high school knows the name of every child, that's a good beginning. That's a good beginning. And you don't have to have a photographic memory for that. I mean, if, the, if they're already over 80, maybe. Right? But if they're still <laughs> under 80, their memories are sharp enough that if they get to know the kids, they'll know who's who. Some of my friends would say, it's an awesome responsibility. But I don't think we have a choice. Uh, I, I see what happens when kids are affected by the enormous pressures out there and uh, are, are lured away and parents don't know it because they're not communicating with their kids. They don't have the time to do so. They may not have the interest to do so. There may some, may some, some discomfort in uh, talking about intimate things. But this is what the, what the time demands. So if we're going to, hopefully, Raise our children. Oh, and by the way, one other thing. We should, whatever we do for the children, should be primarily for their own welfare, not for ours. This is beautifully demonstrated by a kid who sat across the desk, a young man who sat across the desk from me, and he said, I'm sick and tired of being an Achis machine. Everything had to do was to give the parents an achas. It's wonderful. We should all have an achas from our children. But that's not our goal. Our goal should be to give the children the best opportunity to become the best mentioned that they can be. Thank you for listening.